Hello, and thank you for joining us here at the Watkins Museum. Uh, and thanks to everyone participating online as well. Our guests today are authors of a new book, Abolitionists of the Most Dangerous Kind, James Montgomery and His War on Slavery. Todd Mildfeldt uh, taught history, and maybe you'll raise your hand so we know which, who is who. Uh, I know you're celebrities, but maybe not <laughs> quite the one in the crowd. Uh, Todd Mildfeldt taught history, social studies, and science in special education programs in secondary schools. David D. Schaefer served as a park ranger for the National Park Service for over three decades at historic sites in Kansas, Hawaii, Missouri, Oklahoma, Puerto Rico, and Texas. The authors will have uh, copies for sale and signing uh, for those of us here on site after the talk. Now, uh, please join me in welcoming Todd Mildfeldt and David D. Schaefer. <laughs> and uh, I'll just add one request for those of us in the room. Uh, please beware of these cords up front. They're, they're keeping us connected to the outside world. Of those who are Okay, hey, thank you, Will, uh, and thank you to the Watkins for hosting us. Um, we're thinking today, uh, and I told Dave, you know, it's, it's pretty exciting to be so close to where we'll be talking about James H. Lane tonight, and it's uh, exciting to be so close to where he was actually drilling militia troops in December of 1855. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Um, abolitionist of the most dangerous kind, James Montgomery, and its war on slavery. So if I were looking at this book on a bookshelf, I would say, what is <laughs> a most dangerous abolitionist? So, you know, for, for our take, and, and I want you all to also listen and, and form your own take, but Obviously, it goes beyond the realm of an average abolitionist, somebody in the mid-1800s who was against slavery. And for Montgomery, he became militant. He tried his own version of weaponizing the Underground Railroad. He commanded black troops in the Civil War. Uh, and he grew to... Um, he grew to uh, favor black citizenship, black voting, black land ownership. So if you're an abolitionist in 1860 who's going to continue on a development streak like that, you were a most dangerous <laughs> abolitionist to pro-slavery folks in 1860. Right. Okay. <laughs> so most people, they what they know about Montgomery is the movie Glory. And uh, now how many of you seen the movie? Yeah. <laughs> yes. How many of you also get Kevin Levin's uh, newsletter or his Civil War memory? Nobody. Well. <laughs> uh, on, on, he had one about Montgomery a couple of weeks ago, and he stated in that where he he actually kind of asked the question, why did Glory still fill his head so much on, on Montgomery? And I think that's a fair question. So Montgomery's depiction, we believe, Montgomery's depiction in the movie Glory. It's him on the left. Yeah, mass the complexity of his career as an abolitionist, and it's hindered the opportunity to increase our understanding of the circumstances that influenced his path to radicalism. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is give us a give you all a little background in terms of how we got here. <laughs> Todd and I thought of the idea of writing this book 14 years ago. So this has been a long journey. And it has been very collaborative. That's one of the nice things about working with a co-author. Whenever I would find something, I go, I got to share it with Todd. <laughs> and he would do the same thing for me. But we got maybe a little more excited than our spouses about finding some of these uh, dis historic discoveries. And basically, we crafted a book that we would want to read. 
we're very interested in this era and we unearthed, uh, unearthed a lot of material. And in terms of uh, where we got information, of course, the secondary literature, lots of articles and books dealing with this era. Uh, a lot of material, fortunately, is online these days, like newspapers.com, fold3.com has a lot of military records of Civil War veterans. And our research took us to a variety of places. Todd and I went to Massachusetts to investigate Montgomery's connection with New England abolitionists. Here we are at the Boston Public Library Went through the anti-slavery manuscripts. We found some documentation from um, from Montgomery, and our book would not be possible without the resources of the Kansas Historical Society or Kansas State Historical Society, as all of us want to call it. We got Blair Tarr and uh, Virgil Dean. And Virgil, by the way, um, is one of our readers of our book. Gave us a lot of background information, as Dan Smith did right here too. So we got people who read early versions of the book and helped us along the way. So glad to see you all here today. And we made a lot of trips to the Lynn County Historical Society down in Pleasanton, because Montgomery, of course, lived west of Mount City. And in terms of, Todd mentioned the Black Regiment. Montgomery commanded the 34th United States Color Troops during the Civil War, formerly the 2nd South Carolina Infantry. At times, he commanded even two or three Black Regiments. Well, the 34th USCT, the regimental records, are at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. There are six regimental books, one of a kind. You have to go there to get that information. The morning reports, descriptive books, the letter and order books. Now, uh, Todd made many visits to Lynn County to the courthouse to go through deed records regarding African American land ownership in Lynn County. He'll get to that later. But that we really had, I think, a richer, more in depth book uh, because of both of us dig digging into the research together than either one of us could have done on our own. Now, what we strive to do in our book is to tell the story of Montgomery's war against slavery by trying to take it in through the pages of history. We want to give folks a context for what was going on at the time to tell the broader story. And we break up the story of Montgomery into three phases, pre-Civil War, our first six chapters, and then the Civil War. And chapter 15, our last chapter, is post-Civil War. So we have original research, uh, primary source material, in those chapters. Now, we all also want to give a little background. It's essential to uh, consider James Montgomery's war on slavery as a legacy or the circumstances created by two U.S. laws that were passed. The Fugitive Slave Act, the law passed as part of the Compromise of 1850, and this was a great win for white Southerners, the, the slaveholders, because the resources of the federal government would go into retrieving fugitives. Even if they reached Three states, northern states, the U.S. Marshals, U.S. Deputy Marshals were uh, at the, basically at the disposal of slaveholders to chase them up there. And if you were living in a nor northern state or maybe even a slave state, but if you were found guilty of aiding freedom seekers, you could be sentenced for up to six months in jail and fined up to $1,000, which is about $37,000 today. And what the white Southerners did not count on, though, was the backlash. People in the North and abolitionists were only a sliver of the Northern population uh, who wanted to abolish slavery. But even people in those free states, um, they got upset when slave catchers came to their town and snatched people off the sidewalks of their town and took them back south. So there was a tremendous backlash, and James Montgomery would lead resistance to enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act down in Lee County, where he was from. And of course, the other important act, Kansas Nebraska Act, that opened Kansas for settlement. And through the doctrine of popular sovereignty, the voters, the settlers coming into Kansas would vote whether Kansas would be a free state or slave state. And of course, that led to conflict and era is known as bleeding Kansas today. And initially, the pro-slavery side held the upper hand, largely because of those Missourians crossing the border to, to vote illegally. And the pro-slavery uh, legislature, the cop to the territorial legislature really held sway. So Montgomery began to resist uh, pro-slavery forces, particularly uh, Montgomery lived in Lincoln County, but Bourbon County, where Fort Scott is. Fort Scott was a pro-slavery town. The district judge there, J Judge Joseph Williams, very pro-slavery. So uh, Montgomery uh, resisted that and uh, really uh, believed in redemptive violence. Now, uh, a lot of conflict during the 1850s, uh, shootings, some cold-blooded killings, some actual skirmishes. And Montgomery rose to leadership position as a guerrilla chieftain, leader of the anti-slavery Jayhawks. And we found many descriptions of Montgomery where people would talk about how, how calm he would be 
and his sort of gentlemanly demeanor. He was very articulate. Uh, one observer said if you just met him, you might think he was a parson or school teacher, not this you know, guerrilla leader. And uh, he also was a, uh, he had been a preacher in the Campbellite faith, so he could quote the scripture, really a religious zealot. And of course, as Todd said, Montgomery did lead some of the very first black soldiers of the Civil War, and nearly 180,000 men of color would become U.S. soldiers. And Colonel Montgomery, uh, he led those uh, troops with this uh, really fervent desire to inflict the hard hand of war on Southern slaveholders. All right, and I think we're ready for Todd to take over. Okay. <clears throat> Don't want to take your notes. All right. So Montgomery grew up in Ashtabula County, Ohio. He had a strong anti-slavery upbringing. Uh, he moved to Kentucky as a young man, uh, married a woman named Nancy. Her family owned slaves. Um, but she soon died. He married Clarinda Evans. Uh, and living there, Montgomery struggled to make ends meet. This really is his first experience with, I mean, beyond his upbringing, co confronting slavery. And he felt that with his carpentry skills, um, you know, he just had trouble making a living competing against slave labor. So that kind of was his first inroad beyond his upbringing. Uh, eventually, they're going to move to Missouri. They'll live there several years. And when Kansas Territory opens up in 1854, they will move across into Lynn County. He'll find a cabin there. He'll buy that plane, finish the cabin. And as, as politics develop, then that's going to give him his first taste of fraudulent voting. And that, that, really, that also is a, another, you know, another rung on the ladder for him. Uh, but an obvious turning point was the Clark raid in Lynn County, September 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Uh, George Clark and his men cut a destructive path through Lynn County. Uh, early on, Dave and I were like a lot of other Montgomery historians. We believed this cabin had been burnt. And then uh, we grew to change our opinion of that. Uh, but Either way, it was a turning point for him. Uh, Lynn County residents asked Montgomery to go talk to the territorial governor. Montgomery got nowhere. He actually stopped here in Lawrence on his way home. They also weren't going to give him really any help, but they did give him a sharps rifle and a Colt revolt, <laughs> which quite impressive weapons for that. Time. With those weapons, he began supposedly a one-man crusade, which led to six or seven men joining him, and it kind of slowly snowballed in Lynn County. He became a captain, you know, guerrilla captain, and, and of course in those days you didn't necessarily have the rank. Uh, you didn't have to have the rank, you just had to have a group of men that followed you. So I first ran into Montgomery a lot when I did research for this book 20 years ago, The Secret Danites, Kansas for Jayhawkers. So uh, James Lane had been the leader of this secret anti-slavery group, the Danites in Lawrence. And Lane came down to Lynn County in December of 1857, once he's made general of the militia, and he's enrolling these militia groups. And according to August Bondi, uh, you know, he, he enrolled all the men, dismissed them, called them back to the schoolhouse at midnight, and enrolled them in the secret Danites. But Leonhard tells us that, you know, Lane was all talk, and Montgomery believed Lane was all talk. But there in Lynn County, they needed somebody that wasn't talk. And that's when Montgomery led this splinter group, this breakaway group of Danites that in 
February 1858, begins really his career of militancy. Okay. So we're up to 1858. Uh, it's by the end of 1858 that you first see the word Jayhawker in the media, but the earliest we have found it is uh, the letter in April. April, yes. Um, when they they see a group of Montgomery's men going by, and he calls them Jay Hawks or Jay Hawkers. Two separate yes. words. Yeah. Two separate words. Yes. In the summer of eighteen fifty eight, John Brown comes to Lynn County. Uh, Montgomery and he cooperate together. Uh, they're building several earthen forts to, you know, protect the border. One of those is roughly about a mile east of Montgomery's place. So they do, oh, like I said, they cooperate together. Brown wants to, you know, raid Fort Scott, but the men choose Montgomery, so Brown stays behind. But very soon, Brown is given this opportunity to lead a raid into Missouri, and uh, he will, his group will, uh, free 11 enslaved people. And when they come back into Lynn County, uh, one account has them at Augustus Waddle's place, Montgomery, one of Montgomery's friends, and Montgomery encounters Brown and the Freedom Seekers there. The Freedom Seekers are brought up to Franklin County, the very southern part of Franklin County, and hidden for about a month, um, one of the freedom seekers uh, was eight months pregnant and she delivered there. So then Brown will show up a month later, bring them to Lawrence, resupply at Grover's barn. And he has those 12 in Canada by, I believe, March 13th of 1859. So <clears throat> Montgomery also participated in the Underground Railroad. And I said in the opening that he kind of weaponized it. And he might have been influenced in that by his association with Brown. I wouldn't discount that. But he has this radical idea. Instead of sending freedom seekers north, he's going to give them the option to stay in Lynn County. And that's pretty powerful. Actually, I think uh, Hinton the author Richard Hedden suggests that Brown also had considered using Kansas territory as the ending point of the Underground Railroad, skipping Canada. And I would love to know more about that myself. <laughs> but Montgomery, with his, and, and I began to think about this, uh, he, had, he had such a core group that what he begins to think is, instead of sending freedom seekers from safe house to safe house north, if federal troops show up, which they did in December of uh, 60, just kind of shuttle freedom seekers around all of these different people in Lynn County. And if you can do that, if you can thumb your nose at the authorities, and if they can publicize that, yeah, he was on to something. But... Oh, that's oh, yeah. up to you. Oh. So uh, we want to work in some Lawrence angles here in the story because Montgomery would ride up from Mount City probably a couple days by horse. So I'm not sure what route he, he would take. But anyway, um, he came to Lawrence, and I want to follow up on something. The title of our book, actually, Todd found it. This wasn't our, our title. This was the, the managing editor and the marketing people at University of Oklahoma Press. But they got it from... Um, excerpt of a letter, Amos Lawrence, for whom Lawrence, Kansas is named for, um, wealthy Massachusetts businessman, but he uh, wrote a letter in 1855 to uh, Missouri politician David Rice Atchison. And at this time, pro-slavery folks were, were holding sway. Lawrence had been burned and uh, the pro-slavery element really held the upper hand. And it was kind of prophetic warning. Lawrence told Rice, uh, David Rice Atchison, oppression of free staters could make them the uh, make them abolitionists of the most dangerous kind. So the retaliation back. So Montgomery really believed in that, that redemptive violence. And uh, 
He also came to Lawrence in uh, January 1859. He gave a two and a half hour speech at the Congregational Church, which I understand is not standing anymore, the original church, although uh, there's still the congregation in a different location. And we don't know what he said, nobody took notes, but there is a long letter Montgomery wrote that was published in the Lawrence Republican, <laughs> January 29th, 1859. And in it, he talks about the uh, pro-slavery court down in Fort Scott, how they could never convict a pro-slavery man, no matter how guilty. <laughs> and a free state man had no chance almost of, of, of being innocent. So revolution was clearly the right. He really defended his actions uh, fighting against the pro-slavery element down there in Lynn County. In fact, he said in 1859, we had in this part of Kansas a class of violent pro-slavery men who came to this country, to the country, determined to keep out all who were in favor of making Kansas a free state. The plunder, plundering and driving the free state men from the southern part of Kansas in 56 is a matter of history. Anyway, so uh, he really, really defended himself. Now, it's important to note a few things about Montgomery as time went by. The folks down in Mount City have reconstructed his cabin, by the way. Uh, Port Montgomery. I don't know if some of you have been down there. And in 1860, this is pretty amazing. Montgomery was was uh, anticipating more violence, so he had the, the usual log cabin, you know, Abraham Lincoln log cabin with the the beams or the sides horizontal. He added a layer of vertical timbers to the outside of it to make it bulletproof. <laughs> so a lot of work went into his words. His yes, words. his words. Yes, and. Uh, Jesse and, and Janice Randall owned the old Montgomery place. The cabin was right up on the hillside here along Little Sugar Creek, a really beautiful place. In fact, Jan Randall was at our program last night in Mount City. And Montgomery, of course, active in the Underground Railroad. So he would have enslaved people or freedom seekers staying with his family there four miles west of Mound City at times. And this is real important. We get into this in chapter six in our book. Of course, John Brown tried to uh, inspire a slave uprising at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, which is now West Virginia. He raided the U.S. Army armory and arsenal there. Of course, it failed. Uh, Brown was, and a lot of his followers were subsequently found guilty of treason and murder and executed. But it's interesting, Montgomery came to know uh, four of the secret six, the secret backers of John Brown, George Luther Stearns, Franklin Sanborn, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, and Dr. Samuel Ridley Howe. And this is pretty fascinating, another Morris connection here real quick. Uh, Martin Conway, y'all familiar with him, a uh, Morris guy. Uh, he was in his early 30s uh, from Maryland. He was an attorney, real political shaker, mover shaker, uh, representative of the New England Immigrant Aid Company. And in 1861, he'd be the first U.S. congressman to represent Kansas. Yay. But he uh, got a letter from Dr. Sam Gridley Howe, one of the secret six and husband of Julia Ward Howe, who wrote Battle in the Republic, by the way. And, and it's really interesting. Conway stayed up almost to midnight writing a long six-page letter. Todd and I found the original letter at the Massachusetts Historical Society in the Ridley Howe papers. And just real briefly, he said, my dear doctor, you asked me what I think of Montgomery and how he compares with Brown. I think well of him, though he's very different from Brown. Montgomery lacks the puritanical element which stamped Brown's character. In other respects, he may be equal to the old man. For Montgomery will never lose a battle on the hypothesis, hypothesis that the angels of the Lord are camped around about him. On the contrary, contrary, he will forever adhere to the wise maxim of Napoleon that, quote, the Lord is always on the side of the heaviest battalions. As I have no idea, I have no doubt that for settled bravery, Brown was not surpassed by any man who ever lived. He was probably more entirely insensible to danger than Montgomery is, but probably from this very circumstance, he was less fitted for successful command. And of course, very belligerently anti-slavery. And Montgomery was radical, but also pragmatic. Uh, very important distinction there. And George Luther Stearns came to Lawrence and met Montgomery and very much supported Montgomery's um, idea to support fugitives and to try to keep agitation going. So these, these guys were still, even though John Brown was dead, some of these guys viewed Montgomery as sort of a successor to Brown who could keep things stirred up out here. And for Montgomery, a guy like Stearns, a wealthy businessman in Medford, Massachusetts, had money, he uh, could supply Sharps rifles to Montgomery and his men, and uh, really overall just support his uh, war on slavery and had political connections as well. And George Luther Stearns had probably the most formidable beard of the whole Civil War. <laughs> I just want to point that out. 
And uh, Montgomery quoted, of course, um, U.S. troops were sent down to Fort Scott, and they were helping, trying to get U.S. Marshals to arrest Montgomery, but they were unsuccessful. And it's important to note, there were uh, 200,000 roughly enslaved people in Missouri, Arkansas, and the Indian Territory. You see Mount City, Lynn County, Fort Scott, Bourbon County. And Montgomery and his folks, if, if you could keep fugitives in Kansas and make slavery untenable on the western uh, kind of frontier, and they would hope it would roll back slavery to the deep south. But this was all right on the eve of the Civil War. Secession happened and the Civil War got going. Tag team. <laughs> Okay, so yes, as we said, Montgomery and Sturt had this secret plan. We don't really know, you know, how how it would have turned out because the secession crisis happened and war started, of course, April of 1861. Um, Montgomery had plans of having an independent regiment, and that's what he was pursuing in uh, May and June, July. Uh, in, in June, he did launch kind of a, an ill-fated excursion into Missouri to help union unionist families get out safely. Um, that, that one didn't end well. But according to James Hanway, he did liberate first group of black refugees who Montgomery sent them to his old underground railroad connection, James Hanley. Uh, guys, I'm just going to interrupt for a second. Um, it's a, because you're both together there, oh, we're probably getting some feedback. Okay. So if okay. we turn them off and then you like talk loudly, I think it'll still be. Okay. Uh, um, okay. I, I apologize for that, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's our fault. Sorry. That's so loud as I said it is. Okay. So we're turning them off. Okay. All right. Yeah, we spoke without them last night. Okay. Good. So uh anyway, yeah, that's Montgomery in uh July of 1861. Uh, and um <clears throat> I had two men up here. Joseph Trigo, who was an early Mound City resident, will become a lieutenant in um, Montgomery's 3rd Regiment, and Private William H. Dickinson from Montgomery's home county, uh, who will also be in his regiment. So, um, the one thing I want to point out is, at this point, he's still communicating a lot with George Stern, so we, we can get a feel and flavor with their communication. Uh, and they wrote to each other in July, wondering what could be done to help take care of free people. Uh, it, was, it was actually be becoming, you know, an issue. Montgomery wrote to Stearns that he didn't have an answer. But two weeks later, when escorting a wagon train of supplies from Fort Leavenworth down Fort Scott, the Leavenworth newspaper noted this, I quote, that all the drivers were Negroes. The wagon master was a Negro. Nearly all had left their homes within the last 10 days and made for the fort in Dan Montgomery. That is early August, 1861. So with statehood, James Lane had become one of the Kansas senators. He had predicted that summer that if a that a colored army would exit a slave state when the army of freedom marched in. And it seemed like that Kansas troops, Montgomery's troops, were determined to prove Lane right. So when the Senate recessed for the summer, Lane left Washington for Kansas. He finagled a Brigadier's Commission. It's a story in itself. By August, Lane was able to take command of various Kansas units, including Montgomery's. He invaded Missouri in mid-September. This began a cycle of destruction. They destroyed infrastructure, like mills and bridges, but also looted and burned private homes, businesses, courthouses. 
Now, liberating enslaved people was at the top of the list. Soon groups near 100 were being sent across the border into Kansas. Trigo's diary contains numerous accounts of free people being sent across the border. Dickinson noted in his diary on October 24th, this quote, the number of slaves taken to date is over 400. And as fast as we can, they are sent to Kansas. A week later near Springfield, so many black refugees had come into the Union lines. Lane ordered his three chaplains, Reverends Fisher, Moore, and Fish, to take charge of a group of nearly 250 and proceed to Kansas. Filling numerous wagons, the group, referred to as the Black Brigade, reached Fort Scott, where many found shelter and employment. Proceeding north towards Lawrence and its immediate vicinity, Reverend Moore noted this, quote, we had no difficulty in finding homes and employment for them, Lawrence, among their farmers. Well, the Lane Brigade withdrew shortly back to Kansas. Lane left for Washington. Montgomery was left in charge, and the troops went into winter quarters. So, oh, you want to the next slide, not Lane and the sure. supply for the. Oh, okay. Yes, that, that was the slide that goes along with uh, the, the wagon train. This is an actual shot of the wagon train going through Payola. Okay. So we, yeah. All right. So, Todd and I are still working out the timing of our presentation. <laughs> I'm going to do the, the speed dating version of James Montgomery in the Department of the South. So uh, bear with me here as well. Flight, we devote five chapters to this next section that I'm going to uh, move through. So James Montgomery, uh, we really talked about the evolution of Montgomery and his war on slavery. And as a militant abolitionist before the war, his dream was commanding black soldiers, formerly enslaved men on this redemptive crusade through Missouri and Arkansas. Well, another officer was selected to be the commander of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. So Montgomery in December 1862 said goodbye to his wife Clorinda, his kids, and where did he go? Washington, D.C. to try to campaign to get a commission. This was right before the Emancipation Proclamation was to be issued January 1st, 1863. And who did Montgomery meet with? President Abraham Lincoln. You can't get any bigger than that. And uh, Montgomery said that the president received him very kindly, but apparently was noncommittal about giving Montgomery this radical what he wanted. But it's very critical that Major General David Hunter was there. He was commander of the Department of the South, Hilton Head, South Carolina, uh, the Union controlled coast of uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. But he had been out here in Missouri, Kansas earlier. So he knew Montgomery, knew he was an abolitionist general. And on January 13th, 1863, Montgomery got an order from the War Department to raise the regiment of uh, South Carolina infantry. It became the second South Carolina from formerly enslaved men. By the end of January, he's standing on the coast of South Carolina. He's not in Kansas anymore. And a uh, fascinating part of the story, uh, Montgomery's pre-war militant abolitionism really had evolved in 1863 to be this really grim resolve to inflict maximum damage on the Southern slaveholders. And first, this was a practical war measure when you consider freeing enslaved people, destroying agricultural production. But there was a second justification from Montgomery, and that was moral, that the Southern slaveholders, they were getting their wealth, the still gotten away through the sweat of slave labor. So he took the war to Southern slaveholders. And this is an interesting map we put together. It shows Montgomery, different locations where he was along the coast. He got his first 158 recruits for his new regiment at Key West, Florida. They formed the basis of Company A and Company B. And Montgomery really had a clear-eyed focus, a very determined uh, man, very courageous, but also controversial the way he waged his war. And uh, we have a really interesting story, a series of stories. In January 1863, Montgomery helped participate in an occupation of Jacksonville by U.S. forces. He had his, his two companies and the 1st South Carolina Infantry Black Regiment, headed by Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, one of those secret six guys. But a lot of interesting episodes. Montgomery, once they fortified Jacksonville enough, he began going on a steamboat up the St. John's River, a very wide, slow-moving river. And all these are locations where he would stop and disembark. And Montgomery would take his soldiers ashore, forage for supplies, try to free enslave people, and look for recruits for his regiment. I'm just going to tell you one story in Chapter 9. It involves Laurel Grove. Montgomery's... Uh, 
One of his subordinate officers, Captain William Apthorpe, he was in his 20s, very also radical abolitionist, young man, and he was commander of Company B. And he said before they disembarked at Laurel Grove, this plantation, Montgomery gave them instructions. He said, boys, I don't want you to interfere with private property, but if any pigs or turkeys attack you, you must defend yourselves. <laughs> and they found a lot of pigs and turkeys. And they also found a Confederate colonel who was home visiting his wife, Stephen Bryant, and he became a prisoner. And Montgomery and his soldiers took the colonel down to the steamboat. Mrs. Bryant pleaded with Colonel Montgomery to leave her husband with her, that, that she would be all alone. And, and she tried everything she could think of to persuade Montgomery, but it was no avail. And when she discovered Montgomery would not listen to her, she gave vent to her feelings. And uh, the thing she said it was pretty shocking. Captain Apthor said that she told the Yankees that she hated all of them from the bottom of her soul and she hoped all of them would go to hell. And then uh, she crossed the line as uh, Captain Abbott wrote, she was pouring out the vials of her indignation on the heads of us hard-hearted Yankees for separating husband and wife when one of the men spoke up and said, uh, reminded her of the separation of their wives and husbands and children. Of course, family separation, a big part of uh, difficult part of slavery. And Mrs. Bryant regarded the comparison as preposterous beyond all expression. Your wives, what are your wives but nasty old black things, she said. And Captain Apthor said it required a stern word of command to restrain the men from going after this woman. So Montgomery headed back to Jacksonville with the steamboat with the captured rebel colonel and lots of uh, pork and poultry. Now I'm going to devote the next few minutes to this really amazing event that happened on June 2nd, 1863. Now orient yourself a little bit. Montgomery's black soldiers were originally camped at Camp Saxton on Fort Royal Island near Beaufort. This is Hilton Head, the department headquarters. Montgomery would lead a uh, force with three U.S. steamboats. They were armed transports with uh, artillery on board. And he had some of his black soldiers and officers and detached them to the third Rhode Island heavy artillery, white soldiers. And they went up the Cumbie River on this raid of these rice plantations. Unfortunately, one of the um, steamboats grounded and they had to leave it behind. But on this raid, he collaborated with this woman. Oh, oh dang it, I'm gonna write past her. You recognize her? Harriet Tubman, the earliest known photograph we have of the famous Underground Railroad conductor. She was on the Sea Islands and she helped gather intelligence from uh, formerly enslaved people from those Cumbie rice plantations along that river. So she was really indispensable with Montgomery through this whole raid, the civilian on this military operation. Montgomery uh, took his steamboats up the Cumbie River, uh, left a company of men at Fields Point and at Tar Bluff, and uh, proceeded up the river. The troops were put ashore. They, they damaged or destroyed several rice plantations and headed back downstream with a bunch of enslaved people on board the steamships before the Confederates could mount a counterattack. In 2015, I traced part of the Cumbie River route, or raid, the route, and here we are, Eric Poplin, an archaeologist. We stood at Fields Point, and I got goosebumps standing here. If you were on this point in the pre-dawn moonlight hours of June 2nd, 1863, you would have seen two U.S. steamboats steaming left to right here with James Montgomery and Harriet Tubman on a lead steamboat. So uh, a view of it from Google Earth, here's Fields Point, tar bluff, two high locations where the soldiers were left to guard it. The Harriet Weed, one of the steamboats, docked at Longbrow Plantation, and the black soldiers and the white officers fanned out to begin setting fire to barns, outbuildings, homes, they opened sluice gates to flood the rice fields to destroy the crops. This was an act of total war. And they encouraged enslaved people to head for the boats. And Montgomery on the John Adams steamboat went up to the Cumby Ferry site where they had a pontoon bridge and soldiers disembarked to do damage to Newport, Cypress, and Oakland plantations. I got to tour the Newport plantation. And this is the artist's view of what the rice fields would have looked like. And they had all these flood control, uh, flood control structures, dikes and canals, uh, pre-Civil War view of Cumbia River. This is the Newport Plantation. It's kind of angled to the north here, but you can see the canals where the rice fields were. They didn't have some higher ground for corn and cotton and livestock production. And they still have some of those old flood control, control structures there. But I want to point this out, the Newport Mill. At each of these rice plantations, they had steam-powered threshing mills with uh, shafts and the um, belts 
and the thresher would separate the rice grain kernel from the husk and the bran. And this is pretty amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that the, uh, the third Rhode Island, there are white artillery men, they're the ones who damaged Newport Plantation. They set fire and burned the rice mill at the Newport Plantation. Oh, by the way, this is where it is today. And this is uh, Highway 17, the Harriet Tubman Bridge. But it's amazing that rice mill is still there. All these years later, since 1863, the debris has remained in place. I was amazed. <laughs> I don't know about you all. And I, uh, I asked uh, Kay Merrill, who was leading us in the tour, for two small pieces of brick. A small, uh, fire, you could see where it had burned. And I left my brick out in the car, I'm afraid. I was going to pass it around. So I apologize for that. But was, uh, I wanted a piece of that history, this tangible of uh, Montgomery's War and Slavery, this tangible remnant of it. But this is a, a colorized drawing from Harper's Weekly, the July 4th issue. They had an article about the Cumbie River raid. And this is the one representation we have that has survived. Oops. You can see the Harriet Weed, the John Adams, and you get a sense of the flat terrain here and uh, the fires that were set. Smoke columns would have been up and down the river. This was an amazing day. This, the two steamboats pulled up to the docks of those plantations and they blew the steam whistles, that harsh sound that would carry and enslave people, heard it and streamed in from that whole area. Over 700 of them clambered onto these steamboats for freedom. It was an amazing day. They were so excited. And you can imagine being enslaved your whole life. And suddenly freedom shows up one day in the form of black soldiers in blue uniforms on steamboats. It was a day of jubilation. Eric Tubman said she'd never seen such a sight and how they laughed and laughed. And there's wonderful descriptions of women going to the boats with little bundles of everything they owned on their heads. One woman came with a, a pot of rice coming right off the fire. And one woman headed to the steamboat, Harriet Tubman said, with two small pigs under her arms. They said they, she said they named the white pig Beauregard and the black pig Jeff Davis. <laughs> so an amazing day of delivering liberation to these enslaved people. And Captain William Apthorpe has a wonderful description. He said of the welcome that the enslaved people gave them. Lord bless you, Master, they would cry with tears running down their dark cheeks and clinging to our hands, knees, clothing, and weapons. The Lord bless you. We've been expecting you and praying for you this long time. Amazing day. And this is not the Cumbie River refugees. Over 700 made it back to, to Beaufort, and they never lost a soldier in this raid. It's an incredible day. But Montgomery took the men of military age, about 150 of them, and he marched them to camp. <laughs> they were not given an option. They became U.S. soldiers. I found evidence of this in the Consolidated, Re uh, Consolidated Morning Report, June 10th. And this shows the each company, each row, company A, B, C, D, E, F. Well, on this day, they added companies G and H with officers and listed men. These are the key numbers. The regiment went from 509 officers and men one day to 663 the next. Nearly 150 men transitioned from slave to official U.S. soldier. Eight days. So we talked about the Civil War being this the second American Revolution, social political revolution. This is an example of it right here. All right, I'm going to speed through some more history. The 54th Massachusetts arrived. Um, the most famous black regiment of the war, 25-year-old Robert Goldshaw led the regiment, played by Matthew Broderick, Broderick in the movie Glory. And... Uh, he was stunned when Montgomery ordered the burning of an undefended town, Darien. And then after several failed attempts to take Fort Wagner on, on Morris Island, South Carolina, they laid siege to it. And Montgomery by this time was commanding three regiments, black regiments, over 2,000 men, including the 54th Massachusetts and the black troops helped dig the trenches, bringing in ammunition. And Colonel Montgomery wrote letters home to Clorinda at this time, talking about the, the rough duty, the siege warfare, and how they took usually 10 to 12 casualties per day. And the big battle Montgomery fought, 1864, uh, February 20th, Battle of Olusty, about 45 miles west of Jacksonville. Montgomery commanded the 54th Massachusetts and the 1st North Carolina, and they were the U.S. Reserves. They were the last uh, troops at the battle. The illustration here depicts the 8th United States Colored Troops, the only black regiment at the Battle of Olusty, not in Montgomery's command. And this was a dreadful defeat for the Federals. Confederates won the day. 
suffering huge casualties. By the way, the battlefield had longleaf pine trees interspersed. It wasn't as open as that previous uh, version. And there is a state park there. My wife and I walked around there. And Montgomery's, uh, he led the 54th Massachusetts, first North Carolina. The Federals sent in 5,500 soldiers, 1,860 were casualties, killed, wounded, missing, captured, one out of every three. That's a huge casualty rate. And the 54th Massachusetts fought with the railroad line to its left flank, that railroad's still there today. And the last action Montgomery fought, July 1864, when he was in the Department of South on Johns Island, another effort to take Charleston, they were never able to do. And uh, two of Montgomery's soldiers were killed at the Battle of Burden's Causeway, including Private William Brown. I found evidence of him in the regimental books. He was 22 when he enlisted. He stood five foot seven, and he was free during the Cumbie River raid that I just mentioned. And this was remarkable. I found an officer wrote for posterity for all of us years, these years later about Brown's sacrifice. He wrote a uh, Private Brown. He was killed in action on Johns Island, South Carolina, July 9th, 1864. He was a fine young man and a faithful soldier. He was shot dead while standing at his post in the ranks. So these black soldiers were making the ultimate sacrifice. And last thing, Montgomery did come home August 1864 due to ill health. He took a leave of absence and finally had to resign. He was in very bad health, chronic asthma. However, Confederate General Sterling Price invaded Missouri in September 1864 and threatened Kansas, so the Kansas governor called out the Kansas State Militia, forerunner to the Kansas National Guard. And Montgomery, even though he wasn't feeling that well, he had recovered enough that he went to Mount City and joined the 6th Kansas State Militia with his oldest son, Evan. Drawing here by Samuel Reeder of the 2nd South or second uh, Kansas State Militia out of Shawnee County. So Montgomery's citizen soldiers would have been dressed like this. And what happened is uh, Montgomery just enlisted as a private. However, the <laughs> lieutenant colonel leading the regiment got arrested. <laughs> for trying to take his unit back to Kansas. So the men went back to camp and just said, Montgomery, you're going to be our colonel for the rest of this campaign. So Montgomery led 855 men at the Battle of Westport, 13 companies of white men from Lynn County, two companies of men of color from Lynn County in that militia regiment. And the Federals won the battle, and the retreating Confederate Army cut quite a swath through Lynn County, kind of like Montgomery had done in western Missouri and South Carolina and Georgia. So a lot of that retribution came back. Right. Okay. So if this was a presentation by a normal Montgomery historian, they might tell you Montgomery never regained his health and he died in 1871. End of story. That is not the end of the story. So to back up, Dave told you that he left in December 1862. He did not come back until August 1864. Who was running his farm? His oldest son joined him in South Carolina and stayed there. Now he did his next son, Evan. It would have been on Evan's shoulders and Clorinda's shoulders to manage that farm. But remember, Montgomery and his whole family, I mean, we need to get his whole family in here. They had this uh, background of having some freedom seekers stay on their farm. And uh, we are going to, we decided in 2010, we're going to carry this further. This book, 1928 history book by uh, William Mitchell, he stated that Montgomery brought a lot of black uh, refugees back with him from South Carolina and put them up as farm laborers on his farm in shanties. But if you look at the 1865 census, and, and, and that does bear out, there are 69 African-American men, women, and children immediately before or after the Montgomery family name, which lends credence to this story, although none of their birthplaces is along the East Coast. So, as I said, his oldest son was still in service. Evan, though only 16, maybe 17, <laughs> Evan files a homestead claim July 21st, 1863, only seven, not even a full seven months after the homestead uh, law went into effect. 
Now, eight days later, I believe, July 29th, an African-American man named Richmond Wallace filed a homestead on the, to the west of Montgomery's property. Dave and I figured that with, with that, I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence there. Uh, is it a coincidence that it was only eight days after Evan? Did, did he, was he influenced somehow in, in that? Uh, what, was he part of the farm laborers? So ironically, another African-American farmer files in March of 1864, right next to Richmond Wallace. His name was Aaron Quick. And this happens to be the, uh, not the homestead certificate, but the part of the land entry file. This is when you get ready for prove up, you've got to bring in your witnesses. So this one is, when, uh, yeah, let me back up. When Montgomery came home in August, 1864, he, uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, possibly talking to his son, Evan, uh, he changed his exemption claim to a homestead claim. So what we're looking at is his prove up papers in 1869. He has his son, James Charles Montgomery, and there's Aaron Quick, the African-American farm laborer. And they say that we have known Montgomery for seven years. So if you, if you do the math, that puts him quick on Montgomery's farm in 1862. Perfect timing for when he left for Washington, D.C. Here is Aaron Quick's prove up papers. And we actually, whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, we're. <laughs> You're giving it oh, all away. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, we, James Montgomery Sr. and James Montgomery Jr. are Aaron Quick's homestead witnesses. So, there's a bigger story there. After seeing those homestead land entry files, we were able to fill in the gaps. And Dave and I will argue for a continuum of interaction between the Montgomery family and African-American refugee settlers, starting really before the war. I mean, take your pick, 1857, 58, 59, all the way until Montgomery's death, Clarinda will leave in 1875. And so we're arguing there was no point from the defiance of the fugitive slave law in 1859 onward where there was no interaction. What you're looking at here, and I'll try not to hit that button. <laughs> uh, yes, there you go. There is Fort Montgomery. So this is his original 160 acres. They got this 160 acres partly when Clorinda's mother passed. Uh, Clorinda's mother had gotten it through a, a military warrant bounty. He bought this land during the war. There is Evans Homestead. This is an extra 112 acres. Here is uh, Richmond Wallace and uh, Aaron Quick's Homestead. Now, what are the other red? It's not just a black homesteading story. It, it's bigger than that. This is a story of African-American land ownership majority of which was purchased, not homesteaded. So the story that has emerged is really amazing. And when you consider that, oops, I did it again. <laughs> when you consider that Montgomery dies in 1871, Clarinda sells out in 1875, but these African-American clusters will remain till 1900 to 1905. Yeah, thank you, Todd. And uh, Todd did so much research at the Lynn County Courthouse for this. This chapter this is part of Chapter 15. None of this has ever been published before. The fact that actually Lynn County, after the Civil War, 1865, more than 10% African American, all those refugees flowing into the border county there by Missouri. And Montgomery definitely needed help running that farm. His health was very poor. Now, just to finish up here, a quick conclusion. So the end of slavery was a huge event, huge turning point in our nation's long struggle to provide 
freedom, equality of opportunity for all citizens. Nearly four million African Americans freed from slavery. Montgomery did his part as part of that uh, more than 2,000 U.S. sailors and, and soldiers who won the war, defeated the Confederate States of America. And Montgomery, of course, was a controversial character. Uh, viewpoints definitely back then ranged from heroic to villainous when it came to James Montgomery. Even those who supported him maybe didn't agree with everything he did. And uh, we found a wonderful description. A newspaper editor in Rockford, Illinois, heard these stories about James Montgomery out in Kansas and wrote that some insist on it that a pure patriot never trod, others that a greater scandal never went unhung. <laughs> And Montgomery died on his farm, 1871, at age 56. And a longtime newspaper editor uh, wrote a wonderful description of Montgomery. And that editor wrote that Montgomery was courageous yet cautious, quick but cool. He exercised a wonderful power over men and rarely failed to accomplish his undertakings. He was perhaps the best sample of the Western Puritan that the Kansas conflict developed. What he thought and said, he's, uh, what he thought and felt, he said and was ready to fight for. He was a fanatic, just as all men are fanatics, who put duty above expediency and scorned ease and peace purchased at the price of a stifled conscience. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for questions before... Uh, we sell our books, by the way. Um, if you order them online, they're forty-five dollars plus tax and shipping. We're selling them for forty dollars with the sales tax. So just let you know that. <laughs> Questions? We covered it all. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm curious about <clears throat> Lynn County if it had such a <clears throat> friendly character for African Americans. Why Borden Park found it so different than mm -hmm. years later? Well, he, he grew up in Bourbon County in Fort Scott, uh, but he probably might have had relatives there. Um, well, but the, the broader story, well, and as Todd really found it in lot, so many descriptions, it wasn't a necessarily like a racial paradise in Lake County, but there was a whole lot more, more beneficial inter inter or racial interactions, I would say, that you know, uh, blacks owned restaurants that white would frequent, black and white baseball teams played each other. And and at least some of the African American men voted. Of course, the 15th Amendment was coming in. Um, so it wasn't a fully racialized or a segregated uh, community. What's the county um, seat of Lynn County? Mount City. Okay. I yeah. Have yeah. Uh, Todd, you want to add to that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And that's one question that I've asked myself the last four years. Uh, and, and trying to differentiate uh, Bourbon County from Lynn County. Um, and I mean, Gordon Park's comments are obviously true, um, but uh, you know, if you uh, shine a light and, and, and look at some of these other things, you know, Lynn County seems to have been a more progressive county for sure. Uh, but that's something that I'm continuing to explore on a weekly basis right now. So uh, I would suggest that the demographics were important mm -hmm. because of yes. the, pre, pre, the territorial period, the personnel, as you've indicated, are post-slavery because they are on the Democratic Party side. And you will notice that when in talking about people in Fort Scott, when George Washington Carver was actually in the same mm -hmm. position as Gordon Parks was at an earlier date, mm -hmm. and he had the same southern mentality or ethos of being doing labor and so so forth but the difference was that he could labor in Fort Scott because that ethos would allow blacks to work whereas blacks could not freely go in in Lynn County because it was still NIMBY the whole abolitionist movement was NIMBY not in my backyard and, and for the most part but that, but it's demographics that separate the two, because Lynn County becomes a very northern, uh, immigrant age society kind of community, mm -hmm. in distinction to what was going on in Fort Scott, which was Fort Scott was dependent upon its political connections with the uh, federal government. Mm -hmm. and I believe some people think it's an oversimplification, but there was a heavy Quaker influence, especially from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. And if you look at those newspaper articles, there is a very heavy, heavy influence 
Um, in Linn County. In Linn County. That's Lynn the Waddles connection. Yes. And and Trigo probably too. And, and, and Trigo, Trigo. Yes. yes. In the back. This is as I kind of on this thread though. Um, mm -hmm. I so I've not I've been here in Kansas for like twenty three years, but not don't feel like I'm an like a more <laughs> history. Well, welcome. What is, yeah. <laughs> right. Um. Uh, what is the population of Lynn County now as far as uh, African Americans? Excuse me, less, less than one percent. Less than one. People right. of color. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And and the really migration first part of the twentieth century. We think a lot of the migration was um, young people leaving for education right. and jobs elsewhere. And then the older folks just kind of passed away as time went by. Same phenomenon in World War I. Blacks yeah. left Alabama and Mississippi mm -hmm. uh, at the turn of the century because of the opportunities in the North for mm -hmm. employment and less discrimination. Yep, exactly. I saw a couple of hands. This gentleman. I grew up in Because he has a chief shirt. Yeah, in Pleasanton oh, okay. in the 70s and 80s. And this is all new to me. <laughs> yeah. when, when we moved to Pleasanton and Lake County in the early 70s, there was one black family in the entire county. Mm -hmm. Shortly after we arrived, a second family moved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in the 80s, they left. I would offer you just a little food for thought. Uh, three uh, professors, uh, Edwards, Freifeld, Wingo, who've done two books on homesteading. They are they have a very strong argument about. Uh, okay, we, we don't see a we don't see them in later generations. They weren't able to pass on their farms that they bought or homesteaded, but they still gained. They gained a lot of ethereal things that. That they that, that when they left they still carried with them, and you know I I I'm fascinated by this. I hope to flesh this out more, like I said, as we go on. But you know I, I think it's it's fair to look at the land and and the population. But like I said, uh, these African Americans they they took a lot with them when they left. You know, and if I can just tell one quick story, one of the African Americans we described this in our book and introduction. A woman named Sarah Lawrence. They knew her as Aunt Sally. She was enslaved in Arkansas before the Civil War. And when the enslaver, the owner, died, his estate was broken up. All eight of her children were sold, including her four-year-old boy that she was just heartbroken. And when the Civil War came, we realized, well, we often talk about how terrible it was, and it was, horrible war. But for African Americans in slavery, the war brought opportunities for freedom and family reunification. And Aunt Sally and her husband went to Fort Smith. Sadly, her husband died, but she reunited with one of her sons. And they went from Arkansas to Lynn County, Kansas, and were uh, sheltered by August and uh, Augustus and Susan Waddles, friends of Ab uh, abolitionist friends of Montgomery. And eventually, two of her sons moved to Lynn County, and that son who had been separated from her at age four later found her in Mount City. He was married, living in the Indian Nation. The Lynn County newspaper said. But one of the things that's kind of remarkable, she died in 1896. There's a long obituary about her in the Mount City newspaper. You know, how many white-owned newspapers were writing these in-depth obituaries at that time? Kind of shows you kind of the situation in Lynn County. And one final part of the story, one of her sons um, had a motherless daughter, and he asked his mother to raise her. So she raised a granddaughter in Mount City. And the newspaper quoted her saying, she was happy to have a child whom no one can sell away from me. So really compelling stories we found in, in the research. Uh, yeah. Would you comment upon Montgomery's assessment of Darien sacking the town <laughs> right. in the context of Confederate war policy? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. I know it's a sticky wicket, but I think it really does well, need to be addressed. It is, and we, we talk about it in Chapter 11. Montgomery never commented on Darien at all. We just have other people's descriptions. I don't think he had any qualms about it. And by the way, uh, what you saw in the movie was pretty accurate, except Montgomery did not shoot at one of his black soldiers like in the movie Glory. But they torched the town. Um, there uh, wasn't much in Darien at that point. It had been pretty much evacuated. Um, but in terms of Montgomery, he believed it was being used by um, like blockade runners and, and other you know, Confederate forces at different times. 
But in terms of the impact, we did find, we put this in chapter 11, a report by a Brigadier General, Confederate General, who wrote <laughs> to the Confederate War Department saying he could not get enslaved people to work on the fortifications on the coast because the slave holders didn't want him anywhere near the coast. And he cited um, uh, the, uh, like the Cumbia River Raid, Darien, Georgia, and other things that the, it was dangerous to have your enslaved people along the coast. So that was kind of an impact of that. So I don't know if that's exactly not, answering not your question. Not exactly, because okay. my understanding was that there was a quotation, whether it's attributed to him or somebody else, was that he was justifying it in part because the Confederate policy as of April 1862 oh, said correct. that anybody that commanding black yes. troops yes. in combat will be executed and right. treated as a prison yes. if it was a black flag kind of operation. So that's that true. He felt that Darian, if you if your or yeah. if your governmental policy, your yeah. military policy is this pleasant, so you have no reason to ask for order from me. But, that's true. In the spring of 1863, a Confederate Congress passed uh, legislation that said if uh, uh, white officers of black regiments were captured, that they could be you know, in prison and even executed, and black soldiers could be sold into slavery. Wouldn't, uh, totally against any sort of uh, you know uh, the civilized war by any means. And according to Robert Gould Shaw, he did say Montgomery justified burning Darren in part because we are outlawed, as he put it. <laughs> We can do whatever we want. And uh, apparently Montgomery even torched the last building in Darien himself, according to, to Shaw. But we get a lot into the Shaw-Montgomery relationship and how they viewed war. Montgomery, um, really a harbinger of that really hard total war. You know, a year later, General Sherman's marching through Georgia, doing things on a much larger scale um, than Montgomery was doing. And again, try to hinder the Confederate war effort and Captain Apthorpe has a wonderful description, too, uh, where he describes, basically, if, if you take away the Confederates' ability to feed its armies, destroy the crops in the field, destroy the railroads, they can't wage war. And it ends the war sooner. And ultimately, fewer people would die. That's part of the justification. But Montgomery, he was never really reflective where he commented. <laughs> it's what other people kind of said about him. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.